Yeah, let me wait one second. Once I boot up, and I'm set. No, no rush. Are you? Yeah, I'm just checking. So there's good. So we'll uh, we want to go ahead and introduce. This should be booting up in a second. Go till uh, ten to four. But okay, uh, great. You know, since everyone else is pushing it ahead a little bit, yeah. if uh, you're feeling short on time, don't worry about That's it. That's fine. Well, I've got plenty of places to cut. Okay, let's get started, please. Hi, everybody. Um, part of the the, the point of uh, these couple of days is a little bit of get introduced to the finance faculty, and uh, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Chris Telmer. Uh, I grew up near Toronto. Uh, as hard as it is, I still remain an, uh, an avid Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Uh, I did my PhD at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. I've spent uh, pretty much all of my 17-year career teaching here at uh, CMU, used to be called, uh, save one year sabbatical that I spent teaching and uh, doing research in Barcelona at Pompeo Fabra University where I still uh, have a visiting professor job in the, in the summers. Um, I'm a, a consultant for the Federal Reserve. Uh, my teaching here, my MBA, the MBA part of my teaching is uh, in international finance and a class called financial economics. Uh, my research is in uh, a couple of different areas, but one of which is very related to uh, the, the, the teaching that I do, uh, thinking about risk and return issues in currency markets. Uh, something that gets called the carry trade, and uh, as it's related to monetary policy. And I'm the, uh, the administer, administrator uh, of the investment strategy track, okay, the, one of the tracks in our MBA program. And if you are interested in concentrating in finance here at Tepper, you need to be informed about this investment strategy track. There'll be plenty of opportunity for you to become informed, um, and don't forget about that. The boot camp, okay? This is the first time that we've done this. Um, frankly, it's motivated uh, by the, uh, the increasingly early norms uh, of recruiters as it comes to interviewing, okay? It's, at some level, it seems pretty weird. Uh, interviewing students in an ed educational program before they've really acquired any of the education norms that we live with, you know, there's good reasons for this. Um, don't interpret this is obvious, but uh, it's, worth, it's worth saying. Don't interpret what we're trying to do here, what Rick and Bob did this morning is trying to teach you all this stuff in a day. Okay, interpret this as trying to teach you what you need to learn, okay, uh, leading up to the interviewing process and giving you a, a valuable frame of reference. Um, some big picture problems that uh, um, all the tools that you're acquiring uh, are geared towards. Okay, nevertheless, that, you know, that, that, that's the motive for having this boot camp. Nevertheless, having, having sat through uh, part of it this morning, it strikes me uh, as it's a pretty good idea, irrespective of the interviewing. Okay, it gives Tepper a, a chance to put its best foot forward in terms of our, our finance faculty, and I think you saw that as clear as a bell this morning. Um, and it also communicates to you the, the high standards that we have and the high expectations that we have for all of you. Um, what, what's really important to understand about this boot camp is that it is a student-led initiative, okay? Uh, it's clear that the faculty have bought into it and uh, are enthusiastic about it and are putting our time into it, but this was started with the students, okay? And, and uh, 
um, without the students now and in the future, this just won't work. Okay, and, and these, uh, these are a group of people who are doing this for no other reason to help all of you and to help the school, right? They've, uh, they've already <coughs> sunk their costs to put this into, uh, into the language that we talked about this morning. Okay, therefore, on behalf of the school, I want to recognize these guys. Uh, Ish McGee, Justin Siebers, Liam Cooney, Mohit <coughs> uh, Bhatia, Matt Chesson, Jackie Goslin, Jordan Sembauer, and uh, Irina uh, Borodits. Yeah, sorry, Irina, I knew I was going to butcher that. Uh, okay, and um, so I, I thank, on behalf of the school, these guys for, uh, uh, for doing this. It's, it's tremendous. I have you to applaud, <laughs> applaud them. I want you to, to thank them in a much more sub substantive way, which is get involved and take up the baton next year. Okay, um, now let me talk about, uh, about Jim Foster, okay? Jim uh, was an undergraduate at Michigan and uh, an MBA here uh, when we used to call this place GSIA. Uh, Jim graduated in 86 and I think of him uh, not just having gotten to know him, but it's already pretty clear he's kind of a classic GSIA guy or Tepper guy now. Uh, Jim, when you talk to him, he will wax on philosophically about uh, Bayesian vector autoregressions uh, and the fact that everything we need to know about the current macro finance environment is in Tom Sargent's 1973 paper on rational expectations. Uh, that's one part of being a classic GSIA person. Uh, the other part is that Jim has gone out in the world and had a, a major impact on global organizations, okay? such as J.P. Morgan, uh, Mellon Equity Associates, Schroeder Investment Management, uh, where he's held leadership positions uh, both in New York and in and uh, Jim's currently a managing director at Gray Court Associates here in Pittsburgh. Uh, Jim's also taught as an adjunct uh, at NYU and we're in the process of trying to get Jim uh, more involved with our faculty and our, uh, our fina finance program. Okay, Jim's gonna give us uh, a talk about <coughs> how an investment professional forms a market view uh, based on a blend of macroeconomics and, uh, and financial economics. Basically what Jim's gonna do is talk about how to value, uh, um, Jim's going to do for the economy what Bob Damon did this morning for a firm. Okay, I think it's, that's just a very uh, natural and useful link. Uh, earnings and CAPEX from this morning will become GDP and national investment. Uh, negative free cash flow will become a trade deficit. Multiples, like the price earnings ratio for Heinz, will become the price earnings ratio for the S&P 500. Okay, so that's how to kind of put it all together. Okay, so uh, classic interview question. What's your market view? Where do you come up with it? Mm -hmm. uh, associated questions. Take it away, Jim. Great, well, good afternoon. So far, is that reasonable? The, the basic theme today is developing a market view. And it's born out of interviewing. Uh, and th the point that I make though is that great questions drive great thinking. And that's really what I, wanna, what I wanna stress as we go through today. Let's see if this will actually. Now I've gotta figure out how to get this to advance. There we go. So I, the slides themselves are gonna be just a series of questions, but and you can't have it till the, the lecture's over. What I've got at the end are actually the slides with notes. So most of what I see is actually on them, and you'll be able to look at them subsequent to the lecture. The key thing today, though, is get out your calculator, uh, get out a piece of paper, because you can't be passive in this lecture. Uh, I'm actually going to have you do uh, some calculations. Uh, without having given you all of the information, so I want to see how you struggle in trying to figure it out. And you're going to have to pass those sheets in. Uh, and the rationale is that, one, I want you to stay awake. Uh, two, <clears throat> I find that if you really don't push people, even at the graduate level, it's a lot easier to relax and sit back. Um, three, those sheets and use them as feedback. So I can actually go back after the lecture and say, 
Did I do a good job of communicating the key points that were supposed to be there? So stay awake, and uh, I think we'll have a good time. Now, I'm going to start in somewhat of a different place than valuation, at least not valuation of cash flows. I'm going to start with respect to valuation of you. Uh, and one of the things I've always enjoyed when I come to CMU is asking people why they're here. Uh, I actually was denied a job because I told Goldman Sachs why I came here. And the reason I came here was romance. I had no idea what it was like, but my wife had a fellowship in Pittsburgh, and so I applied and got in. Turned out it was a pretty good thing. But one of the questions I like to ask is, why are you here today? Uh, and what's the particular challenge that you face in this program? And then, you know, what should you do with the time you have here? Because it, it will go by quickly, although at points it will feel like it's not going by quite so quickly. Now, generally what people say when I ask that question is, well, yeah, I'm here at Tepper. I'm here to get my master's in business, and today is boot camp. So somehow this Graduate Finance Association thought that there were good things I should learn that would help. When I look out at the auditorium and I look at all of you, I don't see it that way at all. I actually start from your graduation and work backwards. And what I see here is a group of prospective employees, and what you've done, many of you, is exercised a one-time option to recredential yourselves for career change and what you hope will be enhanced earnings over the course of your remaining working lives. And that's important because you only get to do this once. Uh, and many people, you know, you work for a while, there's a sour economy, it's a good time to make the move back, but you've exercised an expensive option and not think about how to take advantage of that is a problem. Now, I also see prospective employees and perhaps partners, and I ask myself very selfishly while I look at you how you might contribute to my business and to my success. Uh, to that end, what I think about is how you differentiate yourselves with respect to everybody else out there that's competing for jobs. And not at Carnegie Mellon, but at NYU, or Harvard, or Penn, or wherever they might be. In reality, of course, the burden is entirely on you uh, to figure out how you're going to differentiate yourself here. The market demanding. When you meet firms, what are the needs of those potential employers? Uh, when you interview with managers, what are their aspirations, what are their desires? Uh, you know, how can you, should you differentiate yourself? And uh, right off the bat, when a prospective employer tries to size you up, you need to think about the two really critical hiring criteria that they're going to seek. There's two questions that I've always asked in every group I've had and every firm I've been with. The first is, would I time my professional success to your personal performance in the workplace, yes or no? And then the second question is, would I see you for 10 hours a day, every day, yes or no? And everyone that I work with in interviewing meets people and asks the same things. And the first question measures technical competence. If you don't know what you're doing, uh, you're probably not going to be very effective in the workplace. And the second looks at emotional maturity. If you aren't proficient both technically and emotionally, you're not going to be an attractive candidate for a top tier position. So I think the issue that you face from boot camp going forward is really one of realistic self-assessment. What do you know? What do you not know? It's an improvement on your part. How aggressively can you move to add value to yourself? Because that two-year option expires pretty soon and you'll be out there competing with a lot of other people uh, in the workplace. So next slide is developing a market view. Now, I, I, you don't have name plates, so I can't call you by name, and I won't necessarily point at anyone unless you start to drift off, but what is an example of a market view? What is it? What do you think someone means when they say in an interview, what's your market view? Yes. Okay. Other other perspectives? Okay. Okay. 
Okay, good. So basically what I hear you all saying um, sounds like economics to me. Uh, so far I haven't heard anything that sounds like finance or assets. Um, when I think about market view in this question and when I ask walk you through what I do. When I'm hiring a prospective employee or considering the development of a partner over time, the, the discernment process really goes well beyond discussing market views. Uh, anyone with reasonable intelligence uh, can recite someone else's market view. This gets to question number two. You need good memory and decent public speaking skills. But I don't know if none of you are old enough to remember Marcus Welby, which was a TV show. But the guy that played Marcus Welby would get on TV in a white lab coat and say, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. And people would buy the products because they trusted him. So to be you know, someone who's not a doctor but plays one on TV, uh, what makes a professional candidate attractive? What, the goal isn't to find people who can talk about work. The goal is to find people who can actually do the work. Uh, and you'd be surprised in my interviewing over you know, 20 or 30 years how many people sound really good until you give them an actual problem. And then they stumble and they don't know what to do. So the issue is you want individuals who can think clearly and can solve problems. And I don't know how many math majors are here, but what's the difference between an exercise and a problem? Uh, grade, yes, good answer. An exercise is something you already know how to do. A problem is something you don't know how to do. And the challenge in interviewing is to figure out whether people can actually be good at problem solving, not whether they can recite all the stuff that they did through their coursework. Uh, so in my work and ongoing you know, discussions with people, I often do ask, what's your market view? And you all started to respond with kind of economic answers. But this morning you did valuation. Today, this afternoon, you're really, in fact, doing valuation. You know, what's your market view? From my perspective, it's not a request for an economic discussion. Question. And the answer to an investment question is always a recommendation to buy or sell a particular asset. By definition, economic reasoning is only a means. It's never the end. And if you really do want to go work in investment or trading kinds of setups, you know, having a discussion ability with respect to economics is just a starter. It won't differentiate you in any way at all, and it won't advance you in the interviewing process. When you recognize that you go to do investments, to buy and sell stuff, not to consult, not to discuss how things work, but to do things, that will change. And that will dramatically change the way you approach your coursework in these two years. Uh, if you don't change the way you approach the course, coursework, then you won't be differentiated. Um, so ultimately, the determining factor in answering any investment question is price. Before you know what to pay for an asset, you need to know what it's worth. And if you don't have a good sense for what it's worth, what's it likely you're doing when you buy it? Thank you, exactly, you're paying way too much. Uh, so if you really don't know what something's worth, you're affectionately known as a sucker, right? That's the way, and we love people like that. Uh, especially so the question I ask here is, are there good investments? Who wants to, to take that one? And think about it. If I'm asking that question, why am I asking that question? So are there, anything, are there any good investments? Say that again. Yeah, you win. That's exactly right. There is, and now this is a key point, if you remember nothing uh, but this today, there's no such thing as a good investment. There are only investments that can be had at a good price or a bad price. Think about it. If something looks really attractive to you today, potential of any product that's ever been made, at some point, the price you pay means that despite all revenue it generates, you'll make no money. So what is a great idea is not necessarily a great investment unless you get it at the right price. So the whole issue comes back to price. So if someone says, what's your market view? They're actually asking you an investment question. 
and an investment question is about figuring out roughly what something is worth because you don't want to overpay. And likewise, if you're selling, you want to overcharge. So forming an investment opinion, you know, what's the end goal? If there was no, uh, if there was tons of room on that title slide, I would have said something like developing a process for forming a market opinion and or a market view. The point is to have a market view to form an investment opinion actually is a substantial intellectual practical process. You're not going to do it after a boot camp. You're not going to do it after Rick Green's lecture this morning, you know, or Bob Damon's. You're actually going to have to spend a lot of time. The problem where the value of an asset on the surface seems pretty straightforward, but you're actually going to spend two years breaking it down into its pieces and with respect to each piece, amassing specific techniques that help you solve that sub-problem, okay? And th that's another way to reorient the way you come at school. None of these classes are really independent. W one of the things that used to drive me crazy at NYU when I taught there was I would teach fixed income and the first thing I would ask them about was operations research. And I'd ask them to do an optimization to derive the term structure of interest rates. And they'd say, well, I don't remember how to do that. That was in my OR class. And I'd say, well, I'll hire you, right? The, the issue is, you know, each building block holding them, thinking how they're going to relate and using them. Now, <clears throat> output is, a, is, an, is an action, right? You're making a recommendation when you have an investment opinion. So you're saying buy or sell a particular asset. Now, what's that process involve, all right? And this is something that's changed in academics over time. Uh, but what, what do you start with if you're going to analyze any particular asset, what do you have to have? You've got to have data, exactly right. So you either got to collect it or you got to generate an empirical process. It's not, you know, you just sit around and all of a sudden it comes to you. So the first thing you got to do is you got to get data. But what do you do with that data? You actually have to transform it into insights. You, now you've gone somewhere, you've taken it and done something with it. And with insights, then you're in the position to actually form an action. So, you know, sound investment decisions aren't easy. Uh, to become skilled and profession, uh, proficient at forming views, what are the characteristics? So now this is back to, you know, as you go through and do your work, what am I looking for? So I'm looking for somebody who is, number one, full, and split it into the two parts, resource full. You don't necessarily have to know everything, but you got to be very quick in knowing where to go to get answers or to get input. That's number one. Number two, you got to be productive. I can't give you a problem and wait six weeks for you to come back with an answer. You have to be very good at using your time. And generally speaking, they're not going to give you one, they're going to give you five. And, and part of the beauty of, of Tepper, uh, they always give you more than you can do. Uh, and the reason is they're teaching you to figure out how to sort it out and how to become productive. But my class, uh, Bill Meany, the guy up there on the, on the wall when you walked in, uh, my class I remember literally a group of animals. We went into our summer internship and most people finished their projects within like three or four weeks. And, you know, employers were saying, well, what's going on? Well, we'd had such a volume of work that we didn't think that pace was abnormal. Uh, so one of the things you really look for is productivity. The third thing is attentiveness to detail. You know, you can't, I, I was reviewing a, a proposal yesterday that went out to a client Client had a hundred million dollars, and the the analyst who wrote the report up said, "Now we expect your annual spending to be thirty million dollars." <laughs> and uh, that's interesting. So you're saying they're going to deplete their entire assets in three years? And the analyst said, "Oh no no no, it was three percent." I said, "Well, there's a big difference between three percent of a hundred million dollars and thirty million dollars. That lack of attention to detail." in an outgoing document to my client really kind of diminished my enthusiasm for this employee, right? So, you know, you got to be resourceful, you got to be productive, you have to pay attention to details. And in the course of solving problems in asset pricing, you got to be pragmatic. You're never going to have all the data you want. 
you're never going to have exactly the right tools, and you need to adapt, and then you need to understand what the limitations are. And the last thing is that you, know, you need mature curiosity, you can't be a lump on a log, uh, and what I call a relentless skepticism that's driven by sound principles and methodical technique. If that's not really the way you come at the world and you want to work in investment management or areas related to buying and selling assets against people who are incredibly smart and competitive, choose something else. Uh, because that's what it takes. You're going to go through a boot camp and go through two years of this program. That has to be your mindset. Now, quick question. Why didn't I mention hold as a distinct decision? I said it's a buy or sell an asset. Why isn't hold really a distinct Okay, she said you only hold until you can sell it. Any other ideas? I mean, if you don't want to continue buying something right now, you should probably sell it right now. Okay, now that answer was if you don't want to continue buying it, you should probably sell it right now. You're constantly making a buy or sell decision. Buying or even just sell based on prices. Okay, now one of the classic things you'll hear, and you maybe even read a case, I have too much invested to quit. What's, that, what's the technical term for that in finance? Sunk cost, and it's a fallacy, right? The, the reason there's no hold is that every day you look at what you own or have sold and need to cover, you look at that and say, capital today, would I make that decision on a prospective basis only? If the answer is no, sell it. If the answer is yes, you know, retain the buy. Okay? But you can't let yourself ever get into this perspective of, well, I've got too much invested to quit. You know, I'm going to throw good money after bad. All those expressions are about sunk costs and that fallacy. Now, here's a great question. What's worse than a loss? Loss. Exactly right. Remember that one? And this is a bit crude, so I'll, I'll phrase this uh, nicely. But my first day on a trading desk, my desk manager said to me, how do you eat a SHI sandwich? Do you know? Quickly, very quickly, yes. So, you know, as you're looking at assets and deciding, it's always a fresh decision, and if you've got to do something bad, you get it done. You don't drag it out. Pearls, uh, pearls of, uh, you know, crass wisdom. So making hard decisions, that's really what this is about. So what characterizes a good decision? How do you know when you've made a good decision? Yeah, anybody? Yeah. Oh, uh, when the returns are high. Okay, so you're equating a good decision with a specific outcome. Okay, that's one way to look at it. Okay, now there's the other end of the spectrum. Did you have, did you use all of the information available to you well at the time you made the decision? Yep. Okay, another outcomes-based answer. He said you achieved the results you were looking for. Now, using the information well is kind of part of it, but to use the information well, did you have enough information, right? So back to this issue of gathering, collecting, generating, and then combining it in an effective way. Well, in, in trying to, and again, today's uh, topic when we get there is going to be, you know, forming an investment opinion about the S&P 500, right? So at its current level, given assumption, should you buy it, should you sell it? Well, to actually make a good decision, a, a rational evidence-based process is required. You can't do it any other way. Why? Because I said you want to be resourceful what are we actually in, in life? We are prideful. And pride is a great detriment in trying to make an investment decision. We're prideful, and the other thing that we've got is a virtually unlimited capacity for self-deception, especially when we lose money. Now, what do you think most people do when they lose money? Oh, it'll come back. That's one. Yeah, I'm, I'm even faster than that. Yep. Yeah. Okay, they, they rev it up, they do more, yeah. Yeah, they lie about it. They lie about it. I mean, the, the beauty of being a market maker that I found was, now wh when you train somebody to be a market maker, you never let them have a full position level first. 
because there's a whole series of absolutely standard mistakes that people make. And you have to let them get through those without losing so much money that their confidence is shattered. And once they've mastered the kind of things and they're not shell-shocked, they can actually go out and take some real positions. But one of the things you have to learn is that when you lose money, when you make a bad trade, when you make a bad investment, my desk manager was such an idiot. I cannot believe how stupid the market is. Watch what you'll do. You will find everything else in the world to blame except yourself and your own thinking process. You know, I loved this when I was in high school. I had a teacher, when you'd come into class late, he would say, why are you late, Mr. Foster? I'd say, well, you know, there's traffic. And I'd make another 50 excuses. And then he'd say, no, 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 why were you late? And I'd have to say, I didn't leave early enough today. All right? He kept pushing you back. When you lose money or you make bad trades, the natural instinct is to lie because no one wants to think that they're not smart or they're not the best. And that kind of prideful instinct something you'll need to counter constantly while you're here and especially when you're out. That's also why you develop tools, okay? And we'll talk about that in a bit. Now, the next, somebody tell me how does an optical illusion work? What actually is happening when there's an optical illusion? Yeah. Okay, it draws your attention away someone else, but fundamentally what is happening in an optical illusion? Yes, I'm deceived. I am not seeing reality the way it is, right? Because my optical hardwiring is just simply wrong, okay? And you look at that arch and it doesn't, you know, St. Louis, you keep walking around it, but you know what? It really is the same distance. So those kinds of things, optical illusions. Now, when you, when you trade and when you make investments, there's a comparable thing called a cognitive illusion. We are absolutely hardwired to make the wrong decisions in really dynamic, highly probabilistic settings. And you'll, you'll study a whole area called behavioral finance, which kind of descriptively understands or analyzes why we get it wrong. And if you'd have been here back in the days of Morris de Groot, you could have taken, you know, Bayesian decision theory with the master, but you'll, you'll study normative decision theory, which is basically how do you go about countering all those things to combine data and probabilities effectively to make decisions. But one of the things you have to realize when you make hard decisions in investing is that they're highly complex probabilistic environments and your intuition is going to be wrong. And if you rely solely on intuition, I can guarantee you, you will get it wrong. And there's many examples of this. I'll give you just a good one. Uh, my, my wife actually sometimes will have difficulty sleeping. Every four or five years, she'll go for two or three nights and not get any sleep at all. And uh, at three or four in the morning, I'll get this nudge and I'll say, what's wrong? And she'll say, well, you know, I'm never going to sleep again. So my answer is first, do you want me to be supportive as a husband or would you actually like to discuss this rationally? Now, uh, now normally, you know, now after many years, it's like, well, yeah, rationally. I said, well, you remember this happened five years ago? Yes. Have you slept since then? Yes. Okay. Well, that's the answer. Well, that's an instance of a thing called anchoring, right? Or actually it's called immediate forecast bias. Your most recent experience conditions your entire view of the world. So, man, you know, markets have been going up. I've been long. And the higher they go and the better they do, what do I infer? The smarter I am. And I infer that that's going to be the way forever. Uh, now, we'll, we'll get to this, but there, there's a few things you need to know. One, nothing good ever lasts forever, and nothing bad ever lasts forever. There is reversion, and that's a key thing to remember. Um, so knowing these cognitive biases that you'll study, and studying them and applying normative techniques, that's a big part of what goes on in making hard decisions. So this is another challenge to you. As you progress through the next two years, I want you to keep two questions in mind because a lot of what you're going to be studying is how to make decisions. And the first is, what makes a decision rational? And it isn't just mathematics, right? A, a lot of it isn't necessarily quantified. But what makes a decision rational? And then another great one, how does the presence of other participants affect your decision making? And that's, that's a critical one in markets, all right? So keep those two in mind, 
uh, as you go through. What makes a decision rational? And how does the presence of other participants affect your decision making? And if you want to think about that right now, just look at uh, the competition in the technology business for two firms trying to buy another one. Well, gee, they started off, the bid was less than a billion, I think. Now it's up to like a billion eight. Now, did they get all these valuations wrong? You know, what's actually going on? How are they impacting each other? And do you think their pricing may be getting a little high? So building models. What are models? Now, we're not going to discuss normative decision theory today or any of that stuff. But, but the truth is, reality is simply overwhelming. There's too much of it, right? So if we were to try and understand all the aspects of reality involved in making an investment decision, what would happen? We'll die before we ever make a single decision. It's just impossible, right? So what do you have to do? You got to narrow it down, right? Get smaller pieces. So you got to choose, and, and this is where judgment comes in, right? Because a good researcher can choose the wrong stuff. But you've got to choose some subset of reality to investigate. Now, we're going to start looking today at the S&P 500 and what's it worth. Well, do we start with sunspots? Maybe. Can we find all kinds of correlations to the S&P behavior that maybe have fundamentally nothing to do with it? Possibly. Maybe we want to start with something like the economy. Well, why? That seems to make more sense in terms of understanding what's going on with stocks. But you got to choose some subset of reality to investigate. And, and the process can be conceptual, or it might be intensely quantitative. But you build models to explain, to explore. Uh, you build them, perhaps, sometimes to predict. Uh, but regardless, you've got to select data and models and on your problem. Remember, data goes to insights. And you're doing it because you're making hard decisions, right? You can't do it just on your own with your own intuition. So we've got to have a scientific process to combat our desires and our incredibly deceptive tendencies. And models in the process of building and refining models help us to do one thing. We, we truly what? When we do modeling well, what is it we really do? That predictive future results was one answer, possibly. That's true. You said protect yourself from your own biases. That's true. Yeah. Uh, well, at the end of the day, you hope it helps you to make money. That's right. But the reason you build models in complex environments is that's the only way you can learn. Right? If you try and do it on your own, it's going to be very inefficient. You need a model to actually keep you honest. And the feedback between you and the model is what makes things work. I kind of am laughing at myself. I said, for all of the joy and rapture that you should be feeling as you contemplate the mystery of an efficient and effective learning process predicated on sound techniques and the application of well-crafted models, well, you must never forget the central truth about all models. And what's that central truth of all models? OK, they're flawed. George Box said this, all models are wrong. Some are useful. Okay, so the last thing your teachers want to hear in class is, well, that's not realistic. Why are we doing this? You know, you didn't capture X, Y, or Z. Well, no. It, it, we're not trying to be realistic. We can't map reality. We know that. We've got to choose a subset, and that subset has to serve a useful function. It could be for prediction. It might be for exploration. You know, do I want a point estimate of something, or do I really want to understand the range of what can occur? Now, we're going to do both those when we try and value stuff, right? We want to say, what is that S&P 500 worth? But we also might want to say, boy, but my assumptions were kind of like the best case. What if, you know, we have a double dip? What if Spain blows? Uh, you know, now you start to create other scenarios, and you've got multiple things to consider and to explore. So here's the augmented summary of this part. And this is what I want you to take away. Market views are investment, period. A an empirical approach is absolutely required to make good decisions. You, these decisions can't be made in a vacuum. They require empirical validation. You are hardwired wired to fail if you go with the flow and let emotions and intuition guide you solely. 
models are required to navigate the complexity. Unfortunately, they're all wrong and only some subset happen to be useful and useful is a function of the particular problem to solve. One, a model can be useful in one context and horrible in another. So, gee, that, that requires some maturity and judgment in how you think about it. Bottom line, there is absolutely no magic bullet. You're going to spend two years studying components of this problem, developing a set of techniques, and then you're going to be out there in a position to try and deal and make choices. People are going to interview you and say, what's your market view? Well, if what's your market view is an investment question, ultimately what that person's trying to figure out is I can hire you or I can hire that person or I can hire that great candidate from you know, MIT. Why are they differentiated? What have they shown me in the interview process? Do I have any basis for inferring that one is better at this process than the other? Okay, that's the issue. Now, I'm going to throw in a couple extra points that I want you to consider as you think about forming a view on the S&P 500. And again, this is just some of the complexity of trying to model. But the formation of market expectations affects the object of the expectations. Right? When everyone's sitting around the marketplace trying to decide what things are going to do, that actually is moving the market. And that's an important part because look at a lot of the models that say, well, I'll raise taxes and I'll have more revenue. Well, no. What, what do people do when you change the rules of a game? They adapt. They play a different, they, it's a new game. They play differently, right? There's a great example, this is a, a modification of it. America, who's never seen electricity, never talked to anyone, and 24 hours a day you put them in front of a TV and they watch American football every day. They watch the Steelers every day, 24 hours a day. Well, American football has four downs, and people tend to throw the ball on third down because they need a first down. But now, and this is for Chris, when that guy or that person goes to the bathroom, quickly change the channel to Canadian football. When you come back, it really looks like these big guys out there thing, but Canadian football only has three downs. So if I'm trying to forecast that people are going to pass on third down based on my prior experience when it's a new game with new rules, I'm going to be wrong. So that's an important thing to realize. People aren't stupid. They, they sense what the game is. They try and determine the rules. I mean, I'll, I'll use it later. My analogy, think rat, maze, cheese ball, right? The rat is going to find its way through the maze to get the cheese ball. The policy question is how complicated do you make it? How frequently do you change it? You can drive the rat crazy if you change the maze all the time, but I think the purpose is you actually want the rat to get the cheese ball, right? But that's, that's an important thing to factor in as you model. And the other thing is that when you start to analyze investment circumstances like the S&P 500, it's useful to think about the future as a set of possible states. You know, I might have a V recovery. I might have a U recovery, an L recovery, a double dip. States of the world. If you're really fortunate, you can construct states of the world that are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Then, you, then you're in good shape. Sometimes you can't. But that's, that's another key thing to remember. And this is a big one. Not every situation can be handicapped. Now, wh what do I mean by that? What does it mean to handicap something? Yeah. To handicap something, you have to be able to set odds. One to one that I'll win this game. It's six to four. There's a 75% chance that the market will go up. Well, there's certain circumstances when you can't handicap. Uh, and I, I leave you a note in here about stuff I want you to, uh, to read sometime. But that's important. And if you think about what's going on in the markets right now, to some extent, this is an element of it. N normally, we just talk about, let's say, inflation and say, well, you know, let's restrict money supply. Let's look at the monetary aggregates. Let's cut them back, you know, because it's just excessive money is, is a really short argument. But what happens when you know, your central bank, your government, and private actors now are all pursuing different strategies? They're not all consistent, and maybe some of them aren't even credible. Well, now, when I start to think about it as a game played by institutional actors, and I start to see that some of the things that they're saying they're going to do, they can't, uh, and I see options and strategies that should be available being if I'm an investor and I look at the world and I can't put odds on what's going to happen, what should I do? 
step out of the game. If I don't know the rules, I don't know how to play. I can't optimize. So, you know, there are very much times, and this will come up in your asset career, where, you know, the blind robotic application of a three-stage dividend discount model makes absolutely no sense because you don't even know what the game is. You don't know what the rules are. How do I know, for example, one of the things I do a lot in is really significant, distressed kind of bankruptcy financing. All right, it's wonderful. You know, I, this is, I, no, I, I don't want to be politically incorrect, but foreclosure, things like that are good, right? And, and there are plenty of opportunities in them to make a substantial amount of money, all right? But what happens when the government decides that they're gonna change bankruptcy law on the fly in the Chrysler deal? Or, you know, you say to a legal entity that I'm gonna coerce you extra legally to play money in escrow. You know, when you start to see things like that where my contract law doesn't hold, when my bankruptcy law is changing on the fly, am I gonna step in and provide capital to people to reorganize in a bankruptcy? No, we step away, and that's exactly what happens. So when you start to model, I mean, for example, one, one of the very best residential mortgage deals that I looked at over the last two years was predicated on a foreclosure strategy. Strategy, Brilliant idea, great people running the business, unbelievable assets, people on the ground in every single uh, area, but I didn't invest in it. Why? Modification, right? The political economy was such that I didn't know whether bankruptcy would actually be allowed because the political economy said we can't let people lose their homes. So the financials and the models and all of the investment analysis said it's a go, but we were in a world where handicapping was impossible and therefore Okay. Teaching objectives very quickly. You can, you can read this when you get through, but what I want you guys to be able to do in your two years are these points. You gotta form your own views on evidence. Excuse me. You got I want you to employ sound economic and financial reasoning, and that's an important point. Most people come into business school thinking as economists. They don't come into business school thinking like people who buy and sell assets. You're going to learn economic concepts. You're also going to learn financial concepts. The marriage of those two is what asset valuation is all about. And so that, that will be something that you need to think about as you go through. And if you're doing that in the boot camp and you're getting people asking you questions about what's your market view, you'll be far better off. The other thing is ask better questions. You know, don't, don't sit there in courses and just accept stuff. Ask questions. Test your convictions. Challenge academic assertions empirically. I mean, not, not everything you hear is going to be right. And engage your coursework with purpose, right? Come at it with something you want to do, like figure out how to value assets. If only because you're going to get that question of what's your market view, and if you haven't thought it through and you don't have some practice at it, you won't, you won't get the job. Valuation <laughs> fundamentals. So now we're going to kick into a little gear here. What are the fundamental objects in any valuation? What do you really study? Okay, risk and return was the answer. That's one. What do you think? Okay. Future cash flows was said. Okay, now his answer was you're, you're looking for intrinsic value and the difference between that and actual value. But the truth is when you're, when you're doing valuation, the fundamental object that you study is the expected cash flow. I gotta have something to discount, right? I gotta have to figure out what it's worth. Now, cash flows then are critical. Now, what if, if you think about what you're doing, you create, you estimate, or you decide what the cash flows are gonna be, and then you apply some function to value them. What, what, what are the properties of that function that it has to satisfy, an asset pricing function? What do we know about people? You prefer more to less, right? You, you prefer to receive items of value sooner rather than later, and you prefer certainty to uncertainty. 
when I ask you the question, how does inflation impact PE? That's actually going to hinge on uncertainty because divergent inflation, trending up, down, moving away from stability, causes me not to know what the equity world is going to look like. So my desire to buy equities expressed through that valuation ratio is going to have to go down. So a simple application of a consumer preference like that can give you great insight into solving problems. Uh, and that's something you need to think through. What are the cash flows associated with something like an, an equity index like the S&P 500? Dividends, absolutely, stuff coming back to you. What else? Well, now that's okay, that's true. Buybacks can impact, but what are the fundamental cash flows that are generated by an ongoing company? Earnings, earnings right? So earnings and dividends are your two friends. So what are we doing? We're narrowing down reality. We're starting to think about how we want to value an S&P 500 index, which is a meaningful thing to do. Lots of people do it every day, right? And we're saying, okay, well, what is it about stocks that we're going to try and value? Well, it's got to be cash flows. And how are those cash flows built up out of earnings and dividends? Now, the, the question next is, what is a market P-E ratio? And what does it represent? Yeah. Okay, so he said a market P-E ratio represents future growth expectations. Growth of what? And? Okay, and where do dividends come from? Right, and how does a company decide to pay them? There's a thing called a dividend payout ratio. The, the board actually decides how much goes out. Okay, so he said it's an expectation of future growth, yeah? How's that? Okay, so what he's saying is if the price to earnings ratio is very high, it tends to imply that something's overvalued. It's only overvalued if what? If the growth isn't going to be what's necessary to, to make that happen, right? Okay, so it's still related back to cash flows. Now, in terms of, I guess, I guess what I want to, what, what is the price earnings ratio? I mean, actually, what are you doing? You've got an asset, could be an index, could be Heinz, whatever it is. What do you, what's the PE actually doing? Okay, now he, he actually just explained what, what a, a cap-weighted index is like, but, but P divided by E, right? Wh why does it get bigger? Let's get really simple. P, E, right? Okay, it's, it's the price of the asset relative to the earnings. Now, why would it go up? Well, no, let's hold earnings constant for the moment. Why in the world would the P, E go up? Thank you. It's an expectation. It's a demand, right? So PE actually is a price, but it's an interesting one because it's expressed as a ratio, and that ratio was intended to communicate something. How much am I actually willing to pay for that annual stream of earnings today? If I really want it, the P is going to go up. And if I really don't want it, the P is going to go down, right? Now, so what are the units that PE is actually in? What, what is price in? What units? dollars or currency. What units is earnings per share, annual earnings per share? Okay, but there's a time element in there, isn't there? It's annual earnings per share. So how many people were physics majors here? Oh, none. Okay, how many are engineers? Oh, so you took a lot of physics. Okay, great. Now, remember in physics, they wouldn't let you just multiply numbers together. You had to use units, and the units all canceled out. It was quite mysterious, wasn't it? So what are the units of, an, of a P-E ratio? Years. Exactly. Why do people say, well, the price earnings multiple is 15 times? What's the times coming from? Yeah. So if the P-E is 15, what does that really mean? Exactly. I'm willing to sacrifice 15 years of earnings to acquire the stock today. It'll be 15 years under my assumption before I get my payback. Now, 
you'll learn all that other, you know, why payback's not meaningful or challenges to it. But, but as a rough rule of thumb, right? So if I'm willing to pay 10 times, I'm giving up 10 years worth of earnings. I'm sacrificing that to acquire an asset now, right? 15, I'm giving up 15 years to acquire that asset now. 30, you know, now think about it. So what PE is really capturing by units of years is how much money are you willing to give up to acquire this asset? And now that's a, that begins to make PE a more meaningful concept. It really is a reflection of demand. If I want something bad enough, I'll give up a lot to get it. And so what we're following in the marketplace is in aggregate, all the collective actions of people assessing prospects, arguing back and forth, trading, they're really saying, how bad do I want this? Is it, I need it, I want it, I've got to have it right now? That's more like a 30 PE or, well, you know, I could maybe, I could take it or leave it. Well, that's probably like a five or a 10. Right? So there's actually an emotional signal in the size and change of the PE that makes it more fun because now it's not just some emotional, inter you know, some unemotional analytical exercise on your part. W what do I face every day? It's actually my mom. It isn't a, a GSA or pardon me, a Tupper class, right? It's my money. I'm deciding do I want it or not? How badly do I want it? Well, boy, I could have taken that money and used it to pay for my daughter's college. Or, you know, I, I could invest it and end up having a lot. I mean, Rick Green characterized our whole finance class as John and Mary want to buy a boat. Do you consume now or save for later? You know, and, and basically the choice is what drives all asset pricing. So PE is really an interesting thing to study from that perspective. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, this is just a question, uh, and we're not going to address it, but just think about it. How is PE impacted during the course of a business cycle? What, ha what is a business cycle? Yeah. Okay, so a, a business cycle is the inevitable consequence of imbalances in capitalist economy, right? Dynamically, you get ahead of yourself, you come back down, you do this, right? Well, if it's doing that, what's happening to PE? PE is moving around too. So why, and this is just an aside, when you study PEs, there's lots of ways to measure it. You'll see the famous Schiller normalized tenure, cyclically adjusted PE. Well, one learn is how do you cyclically adjust? All that noise, you want to try and smooth some of it out so you can turn PE into what? An effective signal. So there's no engineers, but there, I mean, there's no, there, how many electrical engineers? Oh, yeah, signal to noise, right? What, what PE should be for you, and you hope it is, is an effective signal to decide when to buy and sell. The business cycle and short-term fluctuations create a lot of noise that diminishes the quality of the signal. So as you think about PE and what it's doing and how you value assets, that's something to keep in mind. PE calculations, now, the question is really, what is an index? What does it represent? What is the S&P 500? 500 stocks, right? So now, what's the difference between a company and a stock? Actually, here's a simple question. Is a good company a good stock? Why not? Yeah, bad price. Good company can be doing all the right things, but the stock trades terribly. But so now, the, the S&P 500 is an index composed of 500 companies, but you're looking at their stock prices. Now, why, what are those 500 companies? How did they get chosen? Exactly, largest publicly American traded companies. How much of the equity market does the S&P 500 basically cover? Oh, and it's not 90. Yeah, it's close, 75 roughly. So three quarters of equity capitalization is wrapped up in the S&P 500. So that makes it more than just your everyday index, right? What's it a proxy for? Yeah, what are equity investors thinking generally? So now this makes it a much more interesting problem, right? If I'm looking at the S&P's PE ratio regularly, 
and I'm seeing it move up and down in the course of markets, and I realize it's a signal about desire to own equities, and then I realize that the S&P 500 is actually about 75% of capitalization in the states, I'm beginning to follow something that's important from a social perspective too, right? I'm actually listening to people buying and selling and seeing their preferences change through time. So the S&P 500 is a very important index. In fact, they don't want, the Federal Reserve doesn't like to say they look at assets, but if you look at the Kansas City Fed, many of them, well, they've had all kinds of research papers about PE in just this context. Why? Because they want to figure out what's going on on the, on the asset side of the world, too. So question, how do you, do you, do you understand the difference between a cap-weighted index and other types of indices? What does cap-weighted mean as, as a buzzword? Maybe. Okay, so, so an index is, there's 500 stocks. You got to decide how much weight to give to each as you add them up. There's equal weighted indices. They'd all just get the same weight. Capitalization weighted indices do what? Your weight is a function of your total, your price times the total number of shares outstanding. If you're the biggest, baddest company in the world, General Electric at times, then you carry the most weight in the index and you influence it the most. Why would somebody create a cap-weighted index? What's, what's the premise behind it? Well, big companies matter more, yeah. Okay, well, I, I'm not gonna give you the answer to this, but when you study the capital asset pricing model and you start to think about how people express their votes about worth, and whether markets are efficient, then start to ask the question about why capitalization weighted indices. It's a standard form of index, but as markets go up, let's say you really have a bubble and markets are zooming up. The bubble stock is in fact the one most influencing the price of the index. So if in fact the pricing and the desire to own that stock isn't you know, what we would think is rational, then by definition, the index itself is getting skewed away from some kind of longer term fundamental reality. That's what you'll hear when you read, and it drives people crazy, but when you read in the paper, the S&P is at 40 times or 30 times, that's where you get things like irrational exuberance, right? That's where those phrases come from. The world isn't necessarily rational. You know, why am I paying $2 billion for the company only last week I thought was worth $1 billion? Did that much change? in one week, or did I just not want the other guy to get the company? All right, so that, that process will come up a lot. Um, let's keep moving. First principles, now, now we're gonna dig in. When, well actually, step back, the PE equation, if I wanna know the value, if I know the PE and I know the earnings per share, what do I do with them? Yeah, so if I take price, if I take earnings per share and I multiply it times price, I end up with, I mean, multiply it times PE, I end up with price. The earnings cancel out, I've got price. So the S&P 500 is actually, can be calculated as earnings per share times the PE ratio. And we're gonna use that. We're gonna use that a lot. Um, in fact, I skipped one important point. If I know the earnings and the PE today, I can calculate the current index level. That's very different than looking forward and saying I'm gonna use the PE equation to estimate. Remember, I didn't calculate, now I'm estimating. I'm gonna estimate the future value of the index. That PE that I'm estimating out there, I don't know it. It's a, it's a random variable, I'm picking it. Likewise, I don't know what earnings is gonna be. I've got to decide it, then I'll estimate by that equation what I think the future value of the S&P index is gonna be, right? So now the question is when you get to fundamentals, earnings per share, how are earnings generated? Where do they come from? Okay, that's true, I, I, but I, yeah, next. Operating activities. Okay, earnings. Now, I'll give you another example. I had a friend who, when he graduated from college, got hired by the agriculture department, and his job was to build a model 
to predict milk, I think milk supply. All right, so what variables did he use? He got all kinds of variables on GDP, macroeconomic aggregate variables, and he built a really slick econometric model, and it was horrible at production. It didn't get it right at all. Supply was totally wrong. So what did he do? He went back and thought about, well, where does milk come from? So then he went to the stats, and he said, how many cows are there in the United States that are actually capable of producing milk? And how many cows get sick and die? What's the attrition? How many new cows are born each year? So he actually built a model from the bottom up of cows, and then, gee, what's happening to milk production of cows? And that's a fairly stable thing to predict. I mean, they don't go massively increases in productivity for cows every day, right? So then his prediction of supply was actually quite good afterwards. So when you look at earnings, in a nutshell, you can't have earnings without revenue, right? Where does revenue come from? You got to sell stuff, right? Products, services, somebody has to buy it, right? Paying customers buy stuff, sales. That's what gives you revenue, and as someone correctly pointed out, we can translate that down into to, uh, to earnings subsequently. Now, a firm's total revenue breaks into two parts. How do you get total revenue as just an accounting identity? You need two things, and you multiply them together. Yeah, units that I sold times the price. Now, I'm going to jump ahead, but what does GDP represent? Real GDP, pardon me. Well, real GDP is basically all the stuff that gets produced in the economy, right? But they hold something constant. Price is held constant. So real GDP only increases if, if, if the entire economy sold 20 pencils last year. Real GDP only increases if we sell 25 pencils this year. Now, GDP increases because of changes in real GDP and what? Inflation. Right? The price of my pencils may go up. So if I sold 20 pencils last year and 20 pencils this year, real GDP didn't change. GDP can increase because prices went up. Well, now when we're looking at earnings, and boy, aren't we going to make a parallel here. Earnings come from selling stuff, revenues. Total revenue is the number of units I sell times the price per unit, right? Now, what, what happens, though? If I go out, start a business, and I sell a bunch of stuff, do I just take all the revenue and go buy a new house? No. What do I got to do with part of my revenue? Uh -huh. Yeah, and those are called, what kind of expenses are those? There's a couple. There's operating expenses, right? So operating expenses relate to producing goods and services and include what kinds of things? Wages for employees, research and development, costs of raw materials. Guess what? You actually take accounting classes. Why? This stuff counts. I mean, the, that accounting class actually is relevant to understanding what the S&P 500 is. That accounting class is actually really relevant to understanding national income accounts because that's what drives the most important things that you look at in macroeconomics. They are actually all come off the same very basic principles. But it's easy when you're getting jammed in school not to realize that. But then when you get out and somebody says, well, how are you going to forecast earnings per share? Five years out, 10 years out. And you, are you going to say, well, I'm going to build an econometric model and I'll pull a I'll do time series and lagged regressors. No, you're going to say something like, well, if I know earnings today, you know, how, what, what kinds of things, if, if gross domestic product, let me, let me step back. So let me slow down a bit. I'm getting too excited here. and I love this stuff. Um, Walk me through. Um, walk me through earnings one time with a company, just so we get that nailed down before we move on. So, what's the accounting identity that gets me from sales to earnings? Yeah. Yep. Start with revenues. Right. Yep, get rid of my cost of goods sold. I'm left with gross margin. Yep, operating expenses next. Then what? Uh, yeah, now you're getting too detailed. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you got to get rid of the non-operating expenses, things like interest on your debt, depreciation, taxes, all that stuff. That's how the sequence actually goes down. That's how earnings are generated, critical. Now, next question. When are stocks really valuable? When would you like to buy stocks? <laughs> well, yeah, keep going. Well, okay, yeah, that's fine. When they're undervalued, I, I buy that. But generally speaking, why would you want to own an equity? Why would you want to own a company? Well, it's going to do something, right? It's going to sell stuff. It's going to make money. It's going to be profitable. It's going to defeat its competitors, all those kinds of stuff. What kind of environments do companies like to work in? Yes, yeah, remember, prefer certainty to uncertainty. Do I like it when I'm about to be nationalized? Would I really like to do business in Venezuela right now if I were? in an oil industry? No. I mean, you'd be, you'd be amazed the number of people that are moving out of Venezuela and, you know, coming here. So uncertainty is bad, all right? So stocks, now again, that equation, but we got to relate this to PE. We've thought about earnings per share. Now we got to look at PE. When do you think people are willing to pay more for companies? Why would you bid up PE? Well, basically because the environment becomes more uh, stable, predictable. The rules are clear. People know how to make money. They're out doing it. They're not getting taxed out like crazy. They're not being overregulated. There aren't surprises of nationalization and the rest. So the, the insight around PE is that when inflation is basically stable, it's not changing dramatically, that's the chance to maximize PE. What do you think happens to PE in a deflationary world? Do you want to pay more for companies when there's deflation? No. Why? So what happens? So if they keep selling the same amount of stuff, let's assume demand stayed constant in the whole economy, but prices fall, what happens to total revenue? It's going down. They're making less money and, you, and valuing these cash flows. The, if the cash flows get smaller, do you want to pay more for something? No. So deflation PEs are going to fall. What about really high inflation? What happens in that environment? Why is that not good for a PE? Okay. Well, and, and what, what do bond investors do? If, I, if I'm, I'm going to lend you money for 30 years at a fixed rate, and I know, and let's say 7% is where I'm going to lend it, and then you tell me after I've made the loan that inflation is going to go to 20%, am I happy? No, because I'm getting repaid and stuff that's far, it's worth less, right? So inflation actually causes investors on the bond side to demand much higher yields. What's my alternative to buying a stock? Buying a bond. In fact, it's, a, it's less of a credit risk, right? Uh, less risk, no equity risk in the bond. So sometimes. But the, the basic idea there is if inflation's going up, interest rates have to go up. Interest rates going up means that I'm basically having to discount my equity cash flows at a higher rate to make them continue to be attractive versus bonds. Therefore, I got to lower the price. How do I lower the price? By the P.E. ratio coming down. And why would the P.E. ratio go up if, if earning yield, I mean, the higher earning yield for a higher rate than buying a company, revenues are going to inflate as well? Well, but how do I get my earning yield to go higher? If earnings yield is going up, what's happening to price earnings? Yeah, they're an inverse, right? So if the, if the interest rate on bonds is going up and I've got to have a higher yield in order to stay competitive with them, because if I yield less than bonds, why would I buy stocks? I can buy bonds and get a better yield, therefore the PE has to come down. But, it, but in a rapidly changing, and this is an empirical point, go research it. In a rapidly changing world where inflation is happening, are you more certain or less certain about how things are going to work out? Yeah, okay. Now we're going to come back very fast. And the, the question becomes, if, if we know the equation is the index price is equal to the earnings per share times the P-E ratio, and we want to figure out where the index price is going to be in the future, so that I can kind of estimate what my return will be, then 
I need to know where is earnings going to be in the future and where is the P.E. ratio going to be in the future. The drivers of the macroeconomic drivers of this process, real GDP, inflation, nominal GDP. And what are the financial drivers? Earnings per share and P.E. So how do you think these things relate? Walk me through the macroeconomic drivers and how they impact first earnings per share. If all I knew was if all I knew was real GDP, inflation, and nominal GDP, what guess would I make for earnings of companies that capture 75% of the market in the United States? Okay, what does real GDP tell me? It tells me how much stuff is getting made and sold. What's inflation tell me? What's changing in prices? I multiply those two together. Basically, I have the value of all sales in the economy. Well, if these companies represent 75% basically of the productive activity in the economy, if I know the growth rate of GDP that's probably not a bad starting bet for the growth rate in earnings. Now, they're not going to be exactly the same, though. Why? Well, yeah, there's going to be a couple things. Operating earnings, so i got to discount that a little bit. Okay? But also, smaller companies grow faster than the average. Bigger companies grow a little less fast than the average. So if I'm forecasting the S&P, i got to adjust it a little bit. But I'm not worried about getting a perfect answer. I'm just trying to figure out what's a ballpark guess for earnings per share in my valuation exercise. Okay. Now, PE, uh, does that make sense? Do you guys see how that works? Nominal GDP measures all final sales. Many of those are made by S&P companies. Since 75% is attributable to S&P stocks, it's a safe bet there's a high correlation of nominal GDP to S&P 500 sales. And it's a safe bet there's a high correlation between that and respective growth rates of the companies. Okay? Now, inflation, we said, drives P.E. And I'm going to give you a plot. Let's see these around. Right there. What this chart does, and again, remember we said an empirical approach. What this chart does Uh, let me wait. I'm going to hand it out to you first. What this chart does is actually plot every PE versus every inflation rate as far back as we could go. So if we're going to try and make a guess of where PE will be in the future, we look at where inflation is today, we look at where inflation is going, and we try and eyeball it and come up with a, with a guess. I apologize because we are running on time here. Um, so I give, you the pro I give you the problem right now to create the future value of the S&P 500. All right? And we know the equation. It's going to be whatever I think earnings per share is going to be 10 years from now, let's say, and what PE is going to be 10 years per year. In, in 10 years, PE will be. So I multiply those together. There's the picture of PE. Actually, interesting, there's the long-term picture of what PE ratios have done in long-term interest rates. And it seems to be fairly bounded. Average tends to be about 15 times. And what we're going to do is jump in right now and do a calculation. So get out the paper and the calculator. So if the current price of the S and, and you're going to have to ask questions because this isn't going to be obvious, but if the current price level of the S&P 500 today was 1,075.2, I'm going to figure out what we think the return from the S&P is likely to be over the next 10 years. And we know that the current earnings per share is 67 bucks and 20 cents. 
how are you going to figure out the future price level of the S&P 500? That's the first question. So talk out loud, but what information do you need? Okay, I heard GDP, fine, that's true. Now what are you going to do with nominal GDP? Okay, so you can start with inflation, great. We've got some ideas there now. If it's a first guess, what are you going to use as an estimate for inflation, for example, or real GDP? That's a good idea. I just look at the, it's much simpler, just look at the long-term averages, and I'll give you some of those numbers. So let's say we looked over a long, long time frame. What, what's the equation for calculating the S&P 500 10 years from now? Earnings per share, when? 10 years from now, times what? 10 years from now. So I need an estimate of EPS 10 years out, and I need an estimate of PE 10 years out. I know earnings today how can I move earnings today out 10 years? I need what kind of rate for it? I need a growth rate for it, right? Now, if, if you go back to what we were talking about before, if the growth rate of the S&P kind of sales and earnings is equivalent to the growth rate of nominal GDP, what's been the kind of basic long-term growth rate for nominal GDP? Well, no, no. Real GDP grown on average at about 3%. What's inflation been for a long, long period of time? And I don't expect you to know it, but... Well, it's more like three and a half, to be surprised, because we had some high periods in there. So if I know that, and this is an assumption, and just a very base case assumption, if real GDP on average is grown by 3% and inflation is grown by three and a half, what do I expect to be the growth rate for nominal GDP? Six and a half. Now, remember, I've got to do a, an adjustment to go from that to operating earnings for the S&P 500. Rule of thumb, and, you, and if you went back and had the time to look at all the data, it's about 50 basis points. So that means what? I expect my earnings per share to grow over time at roughly 6%. So now, do the calculation. If earnings today are 67.20, and I think the annual growth rate for earnings is going to be about 6%, where do I think earnings are going to be in 10 years? It's a future value problem. The present value is 67.20. The growth rate is 6%. The compounding period is 10 years. 120.34, right? Does everybody see that? It's basic present value to future value analysis. But that's trivial. The point is, how did you come up with a decent fundamental guess of that growth rate? You did it because you realize that sales ultimately got to correspond to GDP. Real GDP actually has been remarkably stable for long, long periods of time. Inflation isn't. It bounces around a lot. But if you take a good estimate for real GDP plus inflation, you got a decent estimate of nominal GDP, and a little bit to get to operating earnings, and we're on the way. We can calculate operating, uh, operating earnings in the future. Now, <clears throat> what do I need to know next? Okay, now... Look at that chart that we had. Now, inflation is assumed to be what in our model that we just did? Three and a half percent. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, well, first off, take a look at this chart then and say, now, where was current PE? How would we get current PE? I, I know, what's the price of the index today? Okay, and that's got to be equal to the current earnings per share times its P.E. The only thing I don't know is the P.E., so what do I got to do? 
I got to take the current price and divide by earnings per share. So what's the current PE? Okay, 16 is slightly higher than long-term average, which is 15, roughly. Okay, so if I'm starting a little bit over, and I'm looking over a long period of time, it's probably going to do what? It's going to revert. It's going to drop a little bit, yeah. And if you look at that shape of a Y, three and a half is, is not horrible. You'd love to see something like one to two percent to really be stable. So it's a little higher than you'd like. So if you're looking at three and a half and you're looking at a PE range, you know, it's going to be somewhere in that range of 14 to 16, whatever. So let's say that we think it's going to revert to the long-term average. We don't have any better information. Call it 15. So now I've used the current PE, information about inflation. It's relatively stable, at least as, we, as we've assumed it. Therefore, my future PE is 15 times. So now what's my future expected estimate of the S&P 500? Okay, how would you get it? I got 120.34 as my estimate of earnings per share based on the growth rate of nominal GDP adjusted by 50 basis points. And I got a PE now of 15. So you're right, 120.34 times 15 is 1805.1, all right? So I know the beginning level of the index now and I know the ending level of the index, and I know how long it took. What's the compound growth rate that equates them? How do you figure that out? Somebody call out the present value, future value equation to me. Okay, he actually went way ahead. I was going to start with the beginning equation. So he's absolutely right. If I take the current S&P 500 today, and I multiply it times one plus an unknown rate, and I raise that to the tenth power, I got to end up with the S&P 500 in 10 years as I estimated it. Now, basic algebra, as I rearrange it, if I take the S&P 500 in 10 years, and I divide it by the S&P 500 today, I'm left with one plus the rate to the tenth, to the ten power. I take the tenth root, do some subtraction, that should be, honestly, you should just do those kinds of calculations totally in your sleep. Uh, it, it, don't leave boot camp without like stamping present value, future value, compound rate, simple interest rate calculations. Your head, flip them around, learn on your calculator how to calculate roots because you'll do this all day long. And this is terribly simple math. So we're just kind of backing into it. What, what is then the annualized change in price of the S&P 500. How much? 5.32%, right? Now, is that, that's the change in price, but what did we say happens with stocks? You get earnings and? Yeah, so is my total return? What, how, what's the difference between price return and total return? Yeah, there's income that came off this thing too. If I buy a bond, would I say that the return from my bond was zero because I bought it for 100 and received 100 when it matured? No. What's the return on my bond? It's the coupon. I got a regular payment off of it, 6%, 7%. So if I want to compute the total return of the S&P 500 under all my assumptions, what do I need to add? The dividend yield. What's kind of an average dividend yield for the S&P over its entire history? It's about three, no, well, that's right, three and a half percent. Now, again, I don't expect you guys to know this, but when you go into an interview and they're saying, what's your market view and how did you arrive at it? And by the way, if you go through your classes here at Carnegie Mellon and you never actually look at the real data, I mean, it reminds me, there was a great uh, Rand McNally. They asked how many people live in the United States. First answer, the guy said was one uh, million. He goes, no, one billion. One million to one billion isn't a very effective answer. You know, if you say, well, I think the dividend yields like 2%, 3% on average, that's fine. If you go, I don't know, or you say, well, 7%, 8%, you know, 
order of magnitude is useful for a lot of these kinds of things to you. So if you add in 3.5% as a long-term dividend yield, what's the expected return from the S&P under these very reasonable long-term assumptions? It's 8.82%, right? So you took the test drive. So what? Now, I, I said you got to make an investment decision off this. Well, you, you've done some valuation. You, you've actually used solid fundamental macroeconomic thinking to come up with a value because you've estimated a, a, an expected return. Now the question is, do you want to buy this at this level? Is that, is that reasonable, what you did? How would you check it? Is 880 exciting? Are you gonna, you gonna go borrow money to buy this or are you gonna run away from it? Well, forget, don't even worry about risk yet. We'll come back to that. I mean, before I get to risk, I got an asset that has no risk but I get nothing from it, I don't care. If you tell me I got an asset with a lot of risk but I get a hugely disproportionate amount from it, I'm happier. What was the first idea of asset pricing? I prefer more to less. Well, what's more in this context? What's a, what's a reference, a credible reference? What, yeah, bonds first. Bond. What are long-term equity returns? If, I, if I'm buying something that earns eight now, and if I look at every period in the past it earned 15, would I be really excited? No. What if it only earned four in the past? I might think this is a great deal. So the first kind of cut is basic. What's long-term returns for stocks? Well, in the eight to nine kind of range is right there. So this is essentially a, a fair bet if all those assumptions were right. But now do we really think inflation's going to be, let's go back to our assumptions. Do we really think inflation's gonna be three and a half percent? Now what I'm gonna give you next This is what your macroeconomic uh, stuff should look like. Here, let's see. He's going to pass them down there. Take, take those, would you? Up here. You got them? There you go. Pass these around. What this is, this is actually, now I did it just for Chris, all the stuff we have from economists today, Canadians. This is an excellent Canadian economist who's actually looking at, macroeconomically, these variables. Now, I don't expect you to read the whole thing, but being resourceful, I would expect you pretty quickly to go in and say, what is he predicting about real GDP? And what do you know just from the markets? What happened yesterday, by the way? There was a revision to GDP. What happened to it? Did it go blowing up or did it go down? It got tanked. It was horrible. So if we said real GDP growth historically has been about 3%, right now we're looking at something like one and a half. Okay? Inflation long term has been three and a half. What do we think inflation is now? Zero. Zero and maybe? Getting negative. So we're actually in a period of disinflation and we're potentially in a period of deflation. So now think back to that exercise we just did. If real GDP is half of what you plugged in, what do you think is going to happen to the future value of the index? How did you figure out your growth rate for earnings per share? You added real GDP and inflation. If I cut GDP, real GDP in half and I cut inflation down by 100%, what happens to my growth rate? It went down, so how excited am I now about the prospects for price appreciation in the index? Oh, no, no, no. Now, likewise, is, is going from three and a half, I mean, put it this way, do you think we're in a stable macroeconomic environment now? No. Taxes, are they sound? Everybody knows what they're gonna be? No. Inflation, deflation? You think Ben Bernanke's nervous? Yeah, okay. So is this a period of tremendous certainty and predictability and we're all pumped or is this a period of chicken little? Chicken little. So if there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of volatility and anemic growth, 
Are you really excited to pay 20 years worth of earnings to get that S&P 500 share today? No. What would you rather do? Uh, you'd actually rather sell it, but if you can't short it, what are you going to do? You're going to wait. Until what? If the long-term average kind of PE has been 15, and you look out there and you say, wow, how, how low has it gotten? Well, it's gotten down as low as like five. Now, I doubt that's going to happen. But, you know, 10 to 12 is not implausible. So if you did your first valuation exercise as a naive Carnegie Mellon student, and you just used totally uninformed numbers, which was the long-term averages of all these, that's a good start. Makes a lot of sense. You learn how to drive the car. You test drove it, right? Now, though, you got to say, wait a minute. I'm in a different period. I need some empirical data. I took that macroeconomic class. Damn, what was GDP? You know, how did the national income accounts work? Inflation's what? Right? Now, when you take that macroeconomic class, you're not going to sit there. Well, by the way, if you don't discuss any of these variables, what is your macroeconomic class at Carnegie Mellon? It's a math class. All right? And that won't help you much. If all you're learning is math, which I think is really interesting and fun, go after your teacher. Because what you really need to understand are these data streams, these variables that drive economic activity that actually count in deciding how big cash flows are going to be and therefore determining how much you want to pay for stuff. Because remember, the point is to merge macroeconomic thinking with financial thinking to arrive at plausible values for assets because what's your market? Do you want to buy it or sell it? Now, when I gave you the first exercise and you used the long-term data, you would have said, oh, I might buy it. It's okay. Looks about average. Now, when you get the revised data and you understand what's really going on in the economy, if the PE today, which we calculated, is actually 16, and you see what's going on with respect to these growth rates, I'd expect to see that PE level fall. Because if it stays, stays at 16, I've never paid for this asset. So now, what's your market view? would be, well, I'm actually not inclined to own the S&P at this level. Why? Well, let's look at the fundamental drivers of what pushes S&P growth. Earnings per share, earnings per share related to GDP plus inflation, uh, real GDP plus inflation. Look at what's happening, okay? PE ratios are a function of inflation and long-term interest rates. Oh, well, that's not very attractive either. Therefore, no argument, you tell that interviewer that you wouldn't buy it. Now, that's actually somebody who's learned to combine the information they had at school with a, a thought about their own money and how they would invest it to say something that's, that's interesting. Now, we'll race through. Horizon and valuation. Now, the, the issue here is we did this over 10 years. Horizon really matters. Read this quote. In the short run, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. What in the world does that mean? And by the way, who said it? No, not Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett studied off this guy. Who? No, oh, Benjamin Graham. Yes, absolutely right. Benjamin Graham. Okay, so what does this mean? It's a voting machine. Okay, answer was short-term psychology, long-term fundamentals. Okay, that's actually true. Okay, the reason that we could do that analysis over 10 years and be kind of comfortable about it is that over time, uncertainty tends to get resolved and how much stuff I'm actually going to get, how big the cash flows are going to be, gets sorted out, in which case it's more plausible. In the short run, all kinds of emotions can happen. And remember, I'll give you going from Graham to Keynes, Keynes had the famous comment, markets can remain irrational a lot longer than you and I can remain solvent. Okay, <laughs> think about that. So if you got Ben Graham telling you voting machine, weighing machine, and you got a set of techniques here that are plausible for estimating returns, if it's a longer run period, you can have a little more confidence in it. If it's a shorter run period, you probably have less confidence in it. The signal from PE is corrupted by a tremendous amount of noise in the short run. Over a longer period of time, you can apply a filter, smooth it, and it's a much more reliable predictor of value. 
Okay, so engineers in the group, that kind of stuff, that's the way to actually think about it. Uh, I was going to give you another test drive. I won't. I got five minutes. Um, and I was going to change the assumptions and make you use assumptions coming out of the capital economics piece, but in a five-year context. All of this stuff's written up in here, and you can see it. Uh, now, what I would have wanted you to think about, had we gotten there, was what do you think about equities in that, al in that alternative universe? you would have said just what we said. Boy, they don't look quite as attractive. And actually, you're getting pretty close to where the market is right now. You, you'll actually leave here today capable of rendering a sentient market view. So if you get interviewed in the first five minutes after you leave here, uh, you'll, be, you'll be far better off. Now, the, the one, another absolutely critical point to walk away with is initial conditions really matter. And you'd be stunned when you do the research. You should do the research. But price, remember I said, there's no such thing as a good investment. Price counts. Well, went back and calculated it. If you look at periods on a 10-year basis, every time, if, if the PE of the market had been 12 or less, and you'd gone out and purchased it, and held it for 10 years, your average compound return was 14.88%. If the PE was between 12 times and 16 times, it went down to 12.9. 16 to 20 times, it drops to 8.5. And, and if you ever bought the stock market greater than 20 times, you enjoyed a spectacular return of 4.33% on average. So look at that differential. Buy it cheap, 15%. Buy it rich, 4%. That's, that's a substantial, that's an 11 percentage point spread on your capital depending upon whether you were stupid and paid a high price or you were patient and paid a decent price for it or a good price, a cheap price. So starting point matters. And when you think about valuation and should I buy an asset or not, you have to have a reference for what's fair. And if it's rich, you know what? You'd really prefer not to own it. Buy low, sell high, sell high, buy low. It doesn't matter what order you go in. Uh, and how do you determine whether to buy? You prefer stuff that's cheap to rich. Fair is okay. Uh, but Rich begins to think, well, who's the greater fool here? Who's the sucker? Uh, and there's other very um, ways to look at this. From a, um, from a true kind of discounted cash flow perspective, we haven't done any of that, right? You, you did some dividend discount models this morning. You probably will look at the Gordon Growth model, two-stage dividend discount, all that stuff. The other way to think about stocks and valuing them is to say, what is the required premium over other less risky assets that I have to have to make it worthwhile to deploy my capital into equities versus these other things? Now, what are the things that you have to have a premium over? Well, I better have a premium over inflation if I'm going to buy stocks. Likewise, I should have a premium over treasury bills. There should be a real interest premium that I receive because I'm taking a lot of risk that those guys don't have to. There's a term premium, you know, notes and bonds that have a longer maturity. A stock is an infinite security, right? So I better beat inflation. I better beat treasury bills. I better beat treasury notes. And you know what? I, I have real credit risk when I own an equity. If it blows up, I get nothing back. So I should earn more than those guys out there who are owning bonds, longer term bonds, because they're actually uh, not suffered to the, suffering the same credit exposure that I am. Well, if you think of that as a cascade, you can look at those distinct things in the market over time, look at what they actually are, and start to add them up. And when we said, what was the return to stocks? Well, if the return to stocks doesn't exceed all those other things that you should have been compensated for, then you should also get a confirming signal that stocks are rich. Right? I'm not getting enough for them. So as you go through and you look at all, again, why do you study capital structure? I mean, when you think about a company and they put together their capital structure, there's equity, hugely expensive. There's things like bank debt, far less expensive. High yield, a lot more expensive. Mezzanine, even more expensive. You create a capital stack, a cost of capital and a funding for the business that makes sense. Well, when you're buying equities, you're essentially thinking about the same thing. The capital stack in buying an equity is essentially the summation of these premia that are required for the various risks that investors take. Uh, and that's something to be very aware of. Now, there's one thing I can't leave without you seeing this. This is critical. 
This is Dogbert, the financial advisor. Uh, can you all read this and see it? This is, this is something to keep in classes. Dogbert, the financial advisor, says to the pointy-haired boss, you should invest all of your money in diseased livestock. It would be unwise to invest in just one sick cow, diversification, but if you aggregate a bunch of them together, their risks go away. This is actually what CDOs were, all right? <laughs> uh, and it's called math. Suddenly, the pointy-haired boss feels savvy. Math solves nothing. It makes do more, uh, more thoughtful generally. If you have to quantify something, you're going to be more precise in your thinking. But math doesn't give you an answer. And there's computational finance people in here. Sorry, I love that stuff. I've done that in my career too. But, you know, economics count. Now, you come down here later, he says, this is uh, Dilbert giving a presentation. I didn't have any accurate numbers, so I just made one up. Studies have shown that accurate numbers aren't any more useful than the ones you make up. Then he gets the question, how many studies showed that? And Dilbert says, 87. That's fantastic. But that's a really valid point as you go through school, right? Don't just make stuff up. What's a plausible reference? How do you bound your thinking so that your answers are getting somewhere in the range? Remember, you got to select some subset of reality that's plausible. Now, the last one's great. Uh, Dil this is Dogbert. He's a creativity consultant. Uh, and the guy says, we need any of your intuition mumbo jumbo behavioral finance. We need quantitative data. Then he says, the only way to make decisions is to pull numbers out of the air, call them assumptions, and calculate the net present value. And he says, of course, you have to use the right discount rate, otherwise it's meaningless. When you study the equity premium that I just discussed, it isn't, it isn't stationary, it isn't constant. Whoa, moves around. So, you know, you got to think about that. And then, of course, he says to him, go away. But those are key things for you as you, uh, as you progress in school. And then the very last thing, what should you do next? Every one of you tonight, oh, I missed it. Oh, no, that is it. Every one of you tonight should go to the CFA Institute Financial News Brief site, and there's the sign up, and say, put me on your list. And what will happen is every morning at 8 o'clock, the CFA read every paper in the world all night long. <laughs> what a horrible job. But uh, it's kind of like being a trader. That's what you do. So they read all these articles. They, ab they pick out the best ones. They abstract them and summarize them. And then they give you the link to the actual paper. Now, if you want to know what's going on quickly in financial markets, because you're going to interview, you're going to talk to people, you want to ask questions like, why in the world are we experiencing deflation now? I thought we put Federal Reserve, well, they've been creating reserves and reserves and reserves. Why don't we have inflation? Well, there's no velocity of money. Oh, well, I created all the reserves and no one used them. That's called you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. All right, well, why aren't they spending them? Hmm, that's a good question, right? But that's where you go. Good starting point. You're going to have access to Rubini's uh, economics firm as students. Fabulous stuff. Uh, he sends out the RGE 360 every Friday. So your weekend reading is to take that and read it. And I'll leave this down here. Here's a, these are printouts of what was there this week. What they do is they, they tell you everything that's coming, all the economic indicators that are coming around the world. And they summarize the best research they did that week. To, you can do those two things in about 30 minutes a week. And you'll be hugely differentiated you'll actually know something and you'll be equipped and this is what you should use it for use it to ask difficult questions of your professors that force them to relate economics to finance finance to economics all of that to asset prices then you're getting somewhere and then make transforming data to insights to actions an active habit if you don't do that you're really not going to be valuable in an employee context all right so test the depth aggressiveness and maturity of your investment thinking by regularly asking yourself, how do I make money on what I'm reading and learning in and out of the classroom? When I was a market maker and people were on the desk would say, I want to be a trader. 
and they'd come talk to you on the desk. I'd say, well, did you read you know, such and such in the paper today? Yes. I'd say, well, tell me about it. And they would recite it to me, just as you guys said. They had, a, they had an excellent recall on what they read in the paper. And then I'd say, okay, tell me how we make money from that. And you look at me like, well, what do you mean? Well, I said, well, if you don't want to figure out how to make money from that, why do you want to be a trader? Why do you want to be a market maker? Why do you want to be an investor? That, is, that may be uh, a, a difficult trait to hold. I mean, I've got a great friend who's an exceptionally skeptical analyst, and they invited him to be a senior person in the firm and be collegial and work with all of the senior leaders to build out the culture and the values of the firm. He finally had to say, I can't do this. They said, why? He goes, I spend my whole life believing everyone's lying to me. That's my job. If I start being nice to people and trying to be polite and think of their feelings, I'll be a horrible analyst. Well, if you want to be an investor, you actually got to think like this. And if you hate thinking like that, don't be an investor. Okay? But that's key. Now, ask your teachers to make the same connections to actions as well. If all they're teaching you is data, you've wasted your tuition money. If they're leading you and providing you with great insights, fantastic, it's getting better. But if that's translating into the kinds of decisions you need to make, running firms, investing in markets, while. Otherwise, it's just a pit stop for a couple of years, and that exercise of option you did, you know, is not, uh, not so valuable. That's it. Thank you. Now, what you guys should do, down here is a very, a half a page, but a brilliant discussion of valuation in current markets by a guy named Dave Rosenberg. He is like the bear of all bears. He's from Toronto. He's a Maple Leafs fan. Uh, read it and figure it out. It's great. Here's the stuff from the RG. This is the entire presentation with notes. All the stuff I wanted to say but didn't. Uh, all the things that you know could have been said are in here. So you can get that and read the notes pages. Thanks. Uh, okay, guys. We're Sorry, we're too late. Step out from underneath there too. Whatever they don't take, I'll take that. Okay. I do. Thank you. But I basically ended up walking you through it. I, 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 I mismanaged my time. If we'd have more time, I might realize. You know, that's another struggle. thing. It's a, it's a good example of uh, another thing we're supposed to learn here time management. Yes, <laughs> yes how not to do it. You guys want to see if I can stall something? Thank you very much. Just we have quick. It was a great presentation. We enjoyed. Oh good. I mean, I learned a lot. Oh good. Thank you very much. I'll get out of your way. No problem. Actually, one of the things I wanted. You have to hit something, right, to get this to come up? Uh, yeah, I think it's... Uh, it's